Calipatria State Prison holds some of the most violent inmates in California. Things can go from, from zero to chaos in about two seconds. Both of you, hands up, let's go. Hands up. There's a couple things you have to accept when you walk into these walls. And one is you may not walk out. A prison where correctional officers are locked in a deadly fight for survival. I stepped into basically a, a, a real troubled prison. I like to stab people. That was my thing. I heard the razor start to cut, and so uh, I figured I'd better grab the razor and I tried to get him off me. At the time, I didn't realize I was being stabbed. I was covered in blood. There ain't no guy right here that's gonna stop it, you know? Now, inside, the prison code. From a distance, Calipatria State Prison could be just another dusty mirage in the scorching California desert. But the men and women who work at this maximum security lockup have no illusions about the threats they face. Stop resisting! It's a very hostile and dangerous environment. The officers come to work every day, they put their life on the line. Vastly outnumbered and carrying only pepper spray and batons, correctional officers are constantly prone to brutal attacks from hardcore inmates armed with an arsenal of homemade knives. There's a couple things you have to accept when you walk into these walls. One is you may not walk out. If you, if you come here and you're not scared, then there's something wrong with you anyway. Calipatria sits on desolate, bone-dry ground 140 miles east of San Diego. When the prison opened in 1992, it was designed to hold 2,100 level four inmates, the most dangerous in California. Today, more than twice that number are jammed into every corner of this sprawling facility. The inmates are very intelligent men, and uh, they, they can be very creative in uh, how they want to get at staff, Warden Larry Scribner is a former CO, a correctional officer who's worked his way up. He took command of Calipatria in early 2006. I came into an institution that had gone through uh, major attacks against staff uh, by different inmate populations, and um, I stepped into uh, basically a, a, a real troubled prison. I like to be recognized. I like to do things. I like to stab people. That was my thing. I, I like to be sticking people in the stomach and wherever. This inmate is a former member of a powerful prison gang known as the Sereños, or Southern California Hispanics. After getting stabbed himself, he sought protective custody and must remain anonymous. I know we'll go around and say, at certain time, certain day, you know, get your things ready, get your knives ready, get everything ready, because we're going to start stabbing, you know, COs. When gang leaders issue attack orders against COs, they can happen anytime and quickly escalate. Whether it's a code of conduct, a belief, they call it their regulations, that if one member of that gang is involved in an incident with a staff member, all the other inmates in that immediate area have to assist. You have to do it. You have to do it. And even if you don't even know about it or you don't know, what, what it was all about. And at Calipatria, there's no shortage of shanks or homemade knives circulating among the inmates. Because that's one thing that's going to keep you alive one day. What is? Your weapon. You know? <laughs> Hello, you're in prison. <laughs> a lot of these weapons probably been found on the yard in cell searches. A lot of times you'll find an inmate walking across the yard acting suspicious. Um, he may look nervous. He may be trying to avoid eye contact. It's basically being observant, seeing what they're doing. Are, is he doing something out of the ordinary? Is he not talking to you? Is he acting like he's got to go somewhere really quick? Um, several officers have found weapons just by being observant. You suspect everyone has it. You never know who's going to have it. The one you least suspect is going to have it is going to be the one carrying it. But in addition to gang violence, officers also have to worry about random assaults. I just hit him in the mouth. That was it. Convicted murderer Jesse Mungia attacked an officer just to make a point. I hit the uh, seal because he disrespected me. Whatever they give me, I give them. They give me respect, I give them respect. If you come in here looking for a fight, I guarantee you there's 4,000 guys here that are more than willing to give you one. Then you can really get hurt around here. And things can go from, from zero to chaos in about two seconds. All it takes is the wrong look, the wrong day, getting caught up in somebody else's madness. Any number of things can happen here. 
Nobody knows that better than Calipatria Sergeant Pickett. Some people are willing to say that I've had the most assaults at this prison myself. I've been um, punched, kicked, hit with sticks. I got stabbed about a month ago. That attack happened while Pickett was on duty inside a housing unit. I saw an inmate that was acting suspiciously, um, followed him up on the tier. I told him to stop. He didn't stop. He pulled a knife out and attacked me with it. Uh, he stabbed me in the back of the neck, cut my eye and cut my arm. And um, I fought with him for about a minute, and then my responding staff helped me, and we got him down. With no warning at all, Pickett was victimized by another gang rule that virtually guaranteed he'd be attacked. There's unwritten rules within the walls where if an inmate's found with a weapon, he has to use it on the cop that finds it. Pickett's wounds were relatively minor, but the scars stay with him. I have a little one right here on my arm. That's uh, kind of scraped me there. And then this patch of eyebrow that I lost is where he got me in the eye. And then the other one's on the back of my neck. It's just a violent place, and, and bloodshed and death is something that you, it's just a shame, but you get used to it. It's the reality of where we work. It's just the reality of prison in California at a level four. I heard the razor start to cut, and so uh, I just figured I'd better grab, grab the razor and I tried to get him off me. The attack on correctional officer Malcolm was even more chilling. He was working the processing desk located in one of the cell blocks. I was the only regular on the floor that day. I think it was Monday. I let one guy out that had a shower, and his cell came down, and I didn't you know, think much of it. He gave me a 602, which is an inmate complaint form, and I uh, threw it on the podium. I looked down, I was like, what's this? That's when he reached up and grabbed me by my chin, pulled my head back, and uh, drug a razor across my throat. It was just a razor blade that we gave him just so that he shaved, and he broke it, pulled the razor out, and from what I understand, I think he melted it into something, like a toothbrush handle, and like wrapped a piece of string around there for a handle. Malcolm will never forget the sensation. Uh, it feels like a dull pain, like dull. You hear it, uh, hear it cutting, cutting your skin. You're like guys who shave, you know, you shave. You can hear the, you know, the, the razor scraping the hair off. Well, yeah, I just heard it cutting into the skin. Yeah, I knew what was happening. I heard it. I mean, I didn't, I didn't feel it. Yeah, I think just because the adrenaline was going. That adrenaline probably saved Malcolm's life as he managed to fight back. I, I was able to grab the razor with my hand and kind of fight him off and wind up over by those stairs right over there and uh, pepper sprayed him. He kind of shocked me at first because you know I'd been in, you know, five years I had been assaulted and it's like, oh, this sucks. Malcolm knows he's lucky to be alive, and he has an ugly reminder of how dangerous his job can be. I have 26 stitches along my throat, along right here. That's part of the risk you take. I mean, that's part of the job description. You know, you could come in here and you could get assaulted, you could get killed. That's just, that's just the way it is. But in spite of this, many officers have found that being attacked has only strengthened their resolve to stay on the job. It's a lot like the military in the sense of I have a crew, I have a good group of guys and, that I work with, and just can't leave. We take care of each other. So, unless I get carried out, I don't plan on going anywhere anytime soon. Coming up. It's a cat and mouse game. It's a matter of trying to catch them when their guard's down. The CEOs unleash a late night raid in the battle to control Calipatria. Hands up, both of you, hands up, let's go. It's all done, hold up. Warden Larry Scribner inherited enormous problems when he took over Calipatria State Prison in 2006. Just because that's how we want to run, there is a, a population of inmates out there that have a different idea of what the day should go like, and they actually dictate the day. Despite officers' best efforts, the inmates seem to be calling the shots. We gotta live here, they just work here. So we have to make it as best as we can for ourselves. For many inmates, making it means following the convict code, which dominates every aspect of prison life. But I'm gonna follow the rules of what, what, what the convicts present me with first before I follow the rules of what the administration give me. Back home in L.A., inmate Antonio Jones was a member of the Crenshaw Mafia, <laughs> part of the notorious Blood Street Gang. Jones says when he's forced to choose whose rules to follow, the decision is clear. The administration, they can take me and they can put me in the hold and lock me up. 
but on the yard, somebody can come up to me and kill me. So at the end of everything that didn't happen, I may be in the hole, but I won't have no holes in my body. Loyalty to the convict code creates a world within these walls where anything can happen. And today is no exception. An alarm sounds on one of Calipatria's recreation yards. As the staff races to the scene of an inmate fight, armed officers watch from towers above. What it, what it was, I guess, an uh, inmate got sliced uh, to the neck, behind the neck area. He got one punch wound on his neck and one on his back. Uh, inmate, the uh, weapon was discovered, uh, so two parties involved, two inmates. The apparent weapon is a homemade knife found lying in the dirt near the wounded man. You don't know if the weapon was out here prior to the incident, if it was brought out from the building, it was brought out from another location. Um, the inmate could have got, picked it up from someone else, received the weapon. It's, there's so many variables. Having worked these yards for more than 13 years, Officer Hernandez is never surprised to find weapons because inmates never stop discovering new ways to make them. This basically shows a lot of what inmates here at Calipatria have used for weapons, weapon stock, uh, the creativity they used in creating something from a piece of metal or a toothbrush. One of the ones we have right here is a couple pieces of a desk handle. Actually, there's a before and after piece right here. Um, what this is, is a, a desk handle from some of the desks here at the institution. They'll take that off, sharpen it down, and turn it into a weapon that looks like this. All that's missing is a handle. Uh, any kind of material they can find, they'll turn it into a weapon. Um, common toothbrush right here. Just a regular toothbrush, sharpened down, melted, turned into a weapon with a handle on it. These are really hard to detect because a lot of times we do use metal detectors. Inmates pass in metal detectors a lot. Um, they won't go off with a metal detector, obviously, because it's made out of plastic. A lot of this material is actual material made left over from construction in the prison. It's um, back from the maintenance areas. Like we have uh, portions of an L bracket right there. It used to be for carpentry right there. They've taken it down, cut it, and sharpened up as a weapon. For some inmates, the prison kitchen is a virtual weapons manufacturing plant. If you're getting ready for war, you have somebody that's working in the kitchen that bring you pants. You know I mean, and you have, there'll be some civilians as a, an assembly line. Making, making the weapons and passing them all out. Some of these, they're meant to kill. Like this one right here, all it is, it's a folded can lid from the kitchen with uh, plastic melted onto it and uh, sharpened down. This is a common weapon. The metal carts that we have to transport the food, they'll break the material off of that, sharpen it down. Aluminum. A lot of the metal detectors before in the past wouldn't pick up aluminum and still don't. But we're working on trying to get newer metal detectors that'll pick up a lot more. So something like that, that's meant to do some damage. If that weapon needs to get to its destination, it's going to get there, regardless of what. And whatever's going to happen, is going to happen, regardless of what. You know? Ain't a, there ain't no God right here that's going to stop it, you know? It's our job to try to stop them, but we'll never stop them. It's been going on since prisons were started. Though the odds of eliminating all inmate weapons is against them, the correctional staff isn't about to give up the fight. Charlie's facility receive information. There could be a possibility of inmates be, could be in possession of uh, inmate manufactured weapons. These officers, all part of Calipatria's special investigation unit, have been up all night planning a weapons raid on one of the prison's housing units. The facility conducted searches on Tuesday. The searches came up negative. I notified the Charlie facility captain and advised them we're going to go ahead and do cell searches in Charlie 5 housing unit. Um, inmates could be, it's a great possibility inmates could be in possession of manufactured weapons and also narcotics. Uh, any gang material, we're going to go ahead and confiscate. Um, let me go ahead and give you guys the cell assignments. It's cold. It's going to be cold. Uh, we have confidential information stating that they may have weapons. And it's uh, 4.30 in the morning this morning. The team walks to the housing unit, fearing the sound of vehicle engines might wake the inmates and alert them to the raid. Uh, we like the element of surprise. Uh, most of the time, these guys will be asleep. If we try to do cell searches any time after this hour, uh, they'll, be, they'll be awake and expecting us. As the raid team approaches the housing unit, they stay close to the wall to avoid being seen from windows. Is your door gate open? Okay. At the entrance, they signal an officer to open the gate. Once inside, 
It's game on. Hold it up, hold it up. Hands up. Both of you. Hands up. Let's go. Go ahead, stand up. Watch this all door. Hold it up. Hands up. Both of you. Hands up. Let's go. Hands up. Out to the port. All right, man. You step back. Sit to the right. The surprise works. The startled inmates are led to holding tanks while the COs toss the cells. They search every conceivable hiding place, meticulously examining anything an inmate could turn into a weapon. And this is a razor, uh, but it, uh, inmate broke it in half. Um, and this is typically what we're seeing on the yard, these flashings from the razor like this. Uh, it's being melted down into a toothbrush and uh, used as a weapon. The raid team even checks the toilet using a technique they refer to as fishing. Officers don't hook weapons in this cell, but they find other contraband. A plastic bag full of homemade prison alcohol, made from bread and fermenting fruit. They also turn up an inmate manufactured syringe. Be very careful with these because these have a needle. It's a cat and mouse game. Uh, we know they have it, they know we know, and it's a matter of trying to catch them when their guard's down. You're always on your toes. Um, some people say, you know, are you afraid to go to work? I say, in a, in a way, yes, I use that fear to keep me on, on my toes, keep me on the edge. Yeah, it worries me the next guy I'm gonna pat down is gonna have something on him, but I'd rather I find it and get it off the yard than it be used on either another inmate or another staff member. Coming up. They said I was the one who started the whole, like, a riot, you know what I mean? The worst riot in Calipatria history. Some of them were kicking me like a soccer ball in the head and upper torso ribs. At the time, I didn't realize I was being stabbed. Nobody ever told Correctional Officer Garza that prison jobs were easy. Every day when I come in, I come in with butterflies in my stomach, every day. I don't know what's gonna happen. One, one day is very different from the next. Garza works Sea Yard, one of four recreation areas at Calipatria State Prison in California. I responded in, on this yard alone to numerous stabbings, staff assaults. I was involved, I've been involved in a couple of uh, altercations with inmates, myself. Knowing the risks, the keepers of Calipatria are geared to deal with even the most extreme assault scenarios. Much of this increased training and firepower has been implemented in the wake of the unbelievable events of August 18, 2005. On that day, a seemingly routine incident on Sea Yard touched off a full-scale prison riot. Inmates know talking about the riot could lead to an attack by a prison gang. But one is willing to take the risk, because he's the one that set it off. They said I was the one who started the whole, like, a riot, you know what I mean? They accused me of starting a whole riot. Inmate Mark Gracia is a gangbanger with a reputation for fighting with correctional officers. But on the day of the riot, he claims exercise was the only thing on his agenda. I went to the yard and worked out, ran a little bit. I like to keep my endurance real good. We'd been getting anonymous reports of um, problems with the Hispanic inmates' population saying that they were going to assault staff. That afternoon, Officer Harbert is working Sea Yard, patting down inmates as they file back to their cells. As Gracia walks by, Harbert spots a homemade weapon in his shorts. Correctional officer pulled me over, and he was like, uh, let me search you. So I complied. Like, All right, go ahead. And when I did, I grabbed onto that object, which I knew was a weapon. It was a rod. It was about, I don't know, several inches long. It had a handle on it. So when he searched me, he said, what's this? And I said, it's a phone book and a pen. So he said, get down. So I said, man, what are you talking about? I thought it was going to be relatively simple. He started to bring his arms down. When he got to about here, he reached with his right hand and grabbed onto my right wrist. When he did that, at the same time, he swung his left arm back in an attempt to hit me. I used his body weight and his momentum to spin him around to the left, and I placed him on the ground right here in the prone position on his stomach. He slammed me to the floor, and then I don't know what happened after that. 
Within seconds, several other inmates in the yard converge on Harbert, who is Gracia pinned to the ground. They began kicking me in the head, stomping me. Some of them I could see stomping me in a downward motion. Some of them were kicking me like a soccer ball in the head and upper torso ribs. At the time, I didn't realize I was being stabbed. As other officers rush to Harbert's aid, the remaining Sorenos gang members of Unit C are compelled to join the fight or else. You can't just be right there and have a CO come and get you. If that Sureño goes at the CO, automatic, you're gonna have, you gotta jump in. You have to jump in, because if you don't jump in, they're gonna get at you. With that inmate rule in effect, the staff on C Yard is in need of major reinforcements. They call the code three, which means everybody and their mother comes from the other yards to, to help out. With all hell breaking loose on the yard, it's not long before officers Melendrez and Ritter are under attack as well. I looked over and I saw several staff members fighting with inmates. As I start to run across the yard, I see Officer Melendrez get physically thrown to the ground. The same one that, that slammed me on the ground started hitting me inside of my head. Just I don't know how many times he hit me, just kept hitting my head, just kept going back and back. And I remember thinking, wow, you know, I need to get back up. And I remember I was mad, I was angry. It was like, you know, these were my workers. And it was just like, I was pissed off. It was either anywhere between three to five inmates involved, all South Side Southern Hispanics. We were wrestling with them on the ground, trying to get them under control. And then all of a sudden you can just hear, you know, shots being fired, you know, the rubber rounds shooting them at them. And then everybody just, I guess everybody just got down and it was over with. It was it. Thanks to the sharpshooters, it seems the staff has Sea Yard under control, but the violence spreads like wildfire. I left that area, came down the yard, and got to the front of Building 5. When I got to Building 5, the alarm sounded. I was in first, my partner Moore was in behind me. What I thought was strange was normally during an alarm, there's a lot of yelling, a lot of commotion, disruption, but it was quiet, eerie quiet. You know, just, just weird, it didn't make sense. Ritter is joined by Sergeant Pickett and they brace for the worst. They were prepared, they were waiting for us. They just ambushed as soon as we got inside. We pretty much just fought together to try to get the inmates off. They were using mop handles and knives and sticks and hitting us in the head and stuff. What went through my mind was, I'm not gonna get home to my kids tonight. I'm gonna end up in the hospital. I'm not gonna come out of this well. I remember seeing an inmate uh, coming towards me and uh, broke a push broom on the top of my head. Once you break it, it looks like a spear. Realizing he's in a fight for his life, Officer Sandoval goes for his baton. I have to do what I have to do. I have little ones at home. It's either them or me. It was just like a war zone in there. Pepper spray was everywhere, blood was everywhere, broken sticks. We just stayed on our feet because we knew if we went to the ground, we wouldn't make it out. The inmates continue the onslaught until the air is shattered with a reminder of who is really in charge. I distinctly remember hearing a loud crack. And after being around weapons as many years as I've been around, I recognize it as a rifle shot. From the security control center high above the main floor of the unit, a single shot from a high-powered rifle effectively ends the riot. The enemy that was shot was standing right over the, approximately between those two tables. And he's being fought. I, I kind of saw him go down, but I didn't realize he had been shot. As soon as that rifle shot sounded, the fight was over. The inmate who's been shot dies instantly. What the gunner saw, you know, I can't answer what he saw, but uh, he saved a lot of people's lives because it could have been very, very ugly. With the riot finally over, officers could tend to their own. 27 would be rushed to the hospital. I was covered in blood. Blood had ran down through my jumpsuit into the lower parts of my jumpsuit. I was dripping all over the place. Officer Harbert, whose attempt to confiscate an inmate's weapon set off the revolt, had been beaten, kicked, and stabbed. Well, this is one side of it. There. It would take weeks for the injured keepers to recover from their injuries, even longer for them to return to work. My family understands where I work. The children, I, I try to make them seem like I'm invincible, so they don't think anything can happen to me. 
and I didn't go into total detail with them. They seen the injuries I explained to them and something that happened to me at work. It was rough for them for a while, but they're doing a lot better now. I know it would have been bad. I mean, four inmates on me. I mean, come on, you know, I'm, I'm sure I could have, you know, did, done whatever I could to protect myself, but it would have been bad. They could have probably killed me. The man who allegedly started the riot, Mark Gracia, continues to claim he wasn't carrying a weapon that day because he was so close to serving out his time. I was short. I was going home. Why would I carry a weapon on, you know what I mean? Why do I need to carry a weapon? But Gracia didn't make it home. His attack on Officer Harbor bought him three years in solitary confinement. Soon, talk of revenge swirled throughout the prison. We immediately got a rush of intelligence that the inmates were going to retaliate in a two-for-one manner. It means they were going to attempt to commit, you know, atrocities or seriously injure two staff members at least for every one inmate that was injured. Coming up. This is a very hateful environment. The prison braces for retaliation from the riot. In the aftermath of the Calipatria State Prison riot, the battered correctional staff faced yet another threat that still persists today. There's always rumors and there's always talk of a green light on staff. They're gonna, they want to kill two of us for one of them. With some of the most violent prisoners in California seeking revenge against the officers, the prison had to mobilize to protect its own. Um, what we did is we, we removed from this institution a lot of those inmates. We almost changed over the Hispanics on Sea Yard, probably 95% of them. So we have very few of the initial inmates that were on that yard there. So our, our hope is by doing that, that the remaining inmates don't feel that they're driven by that initial, by those initial threats, by those initial promises that they were made. After getting rid of the ringleaders, prison officials beefed up other security policies. Lockdowns have increased, and there are new restrictions on how inmates move about the facility, such as walking in single file lines to Chow Hall. I believe that the walking in a, a straight line uh, gives officers better, better visibility of what the inmates are up to. Um, I have a lot of experience in watching inmates walk side by side or, or in little groups and attack. And uh, when, if you have everybody walking in a single line and all of a sudden they bunch up, something's going to happen. Something's wrong. But in single line, it's easy to identify very quickly where there's something going on. But the restrictions don't stop at single file lines. New security measures have been taken at the cell block desk where Officer Malcolm had his throat slashed. They've decided to put the bars up since the riot. Uh, the reasoning for the bars and the lines, and I'll explain, the yellow lines, the inmates actually could come into the yellow line, but they cannot pass the red tape. It's out of bounds. Once they pass this, the gunner from above is gonna put the building down, the inmates are to get down, the alarm will sound. Any inmate that crosses that red line has no other thoughts other than to try and injure a staff member. Uh, and that's the message I'm, I'm putting out to the population. There is no need for them to ever get that close to that podium. They get a warning line before the red line to say, hey, you need to stay out of there, back off. Since the riot, inmates must also strip down and pass through metal detectors before going out to the yard. While the goal is safety, it might be pushing inmates to the boiling point. They don't understand the things that we go through ourselves, you know what I mean? How much anger we carry inside us and how we just don't talk to people. You know, a lot of, a lot of people, they don't see the things that we go to and how we'll just snap at anything. The unrelenting threats posed by the inmates here can affect officers in more than just a physical way. This is a very hateful environment. And if you're not careful, it can change you. It can change your character, it can change the way you look at people, it can change many things about you. It, it affects my ability to be out in public. I'm very wary of crowds. I don't like being around a lot of people. I definitely don't like people getting behind me. People should be thankful that we have prisons because I'm telling you, some of these guys are never gonna change. And even though we call them institutionalized, you know, they're criminals and all this, uh, this is pretty much the only place they can function. And survive. But some inmates hope to change that attitude. 
And, and when we come together, that's, that's what gives us a power. That's what they, sh they see that it's really a problem. Inmate George Armenta is an active member of the Sorenos prison gang, but he's also the inmate representative to a prison advisory council that helps set policies. I still feel that communication is a big plus, you know, so if there's communication between administration and, 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 and the inmate, there's always going to be some type of uh, uh, resolution to problems. Even though Armenta represents the inmates' grievances, he's still bound by gang rules. One of them is never talk to the media. Coming up, Armenta pays the price for breaking gang rules. We had a two-on-one uh, with weapon with serious injury uh, last night. At Calipatria State Prison, there is only one constant. No one is safe from violence. We had a two-on-one uh, with weapon with serious injury uh, last night. Uh, Edmund Armenta was the victim. He, uh, he got 11 puncture wounds uh, to the chest area. And at this point in time, he's in central health. George Armenta is a voice for the inmates, but that didn't spare him. As a member of one of the prison's largest Hispanic gangs, he spoke too much and to the wrong people. One of their policies is not to speak to reporters, not to speak uh, to correction officers. So um, since he was interviewed by Court TV, we can only speculate that he was assaulted for that purpose. Armenta was attacked within hours of giving our camera crew an interview. Prison medical personnel expect him to survive. But prison gang members who speak to the media are not the only ones in the crosshairs. When inmates become targets, Calipatria's correctional officers move them to SNY, the sensitive needs yard. The inmates on the other yards, they would just as soon come over here and take the, all these guys out. They're over here for various reasons. Maybe they uh, had testified against someone and they're here for that reason. There's a hit out on them. Uh, we have quite a few sex offenders. We don't like child molesters. We don't like rapists. I mean, we, we ourselves, we fight against that. And a lot of times when people get on TV, they wanna, they wanna, uh, they wanna uh, put everybody as a group. Oh, there's a murderer, there's a child molester, there's a, a robber right there. It ain't even like that. I mean, that makes us look bad. I mean, that, that we wanna be around them type of people. We don't wanna be around them more than anybody out there wants to be around them. They don't want no child molesters, they don't want no rapists, they don't want no, no snitches, they don't want nothing because it, it's, it's all trash in the mainland. It's all trash. But Officer Bishop, a 12-year veteran at Calipatria, prefers working the SNY yard because inmates aren't ruled by the convict code. I feel uh, more, more comfortable. I'm not constantly looking over my shoulder. And these guys over here, if, if something's going on, chances are you're going to find out. And on the main line, if something's going on, you'll find out when it happens. The main line, they're in it for themselves, and if they want to go against staff, they will. And they have. I've been there, done that. On this yard here, uh, they don't normally go against staff. They'll go against each other. They'll, they'll so to speak, clean house. Some inmates are on the sensitive needs yard, not because of what they've done, but because of who they are. Especially in here, because they think you're gay, you, they think you automatically will have sex or that type of stuff, I'm not doing that. Richard Morey, serving time for murder, requested the sensitive needs yard to escape the dangers of the main line. They're gonna try to use you, whatever, because that's what they consider us, like a little pawn. Uh, I just have to, you know, be tough and I've had a friend that got sliced in the face in front of me because he was gay. It wasn't on the pretty side. The razor blade. So uh, all you see is the skin opening up and the blood coming out. So over here, we don't have to worry about none of that. In fact, Maury has found some peace of mind here. If I'm not doing anything, I go in the cell, I draw, I make cards. I try to keep myself occupied. But most people, they like because for gay people, we, we do laundry, we cook. Some men like that. 
Andrew Williams serves his time on the sensitive needs yard as well. Williams was 15 years old when he shot and killed two classmates at his high school. He came to Calipatria when he turned 18 and was placed on the main line with the toughest prisoners. A couple of white guys came into my cell and told me what would be expected of me. And because I was young and, and white, he was basically giving me like the, the 60 second rundown, like, all right, uh, this is who you're gonna run with when, when you go out to the yard. Uh, you're gonna hold our weapons. Uh, when you, if you get visits, you're gonna bring our dope to us. Uh, if, we, if we need you to, and like, if, if we jump on somebody, you're gonna jump in with it. And if we're stabbing them, you're gonna pick up a knife and stab them. Williams says the inmates left no doubt what would happen to him if he refused to cooperate. Soon after, he was transferred to the sensitive needs yard. I'm really fortunate that I never got put in that, in that circumstance, and I never got put in a situation where I would have to go do this stuff. Away from the threats of other inmates, Williams has plenty of time to think about his crime and his sentence of 50 years to life. I've, I've seen people get jumped on, I've seen people get stabbed, and it's, it's definitely gloomy, and it kind of puts everything in perspective. I, I did this to myself. Do you ever think back on that day? Mm -hmm. All the time. Tell me about it. What do you think about it? Uh, I mean, it's easy to let like all this negative stuff creep up and say, "Oh, well, I'm a horrible person because I've done this," but it's, it was a, a tragic, tragic mistake. And I've not move on, but I've just I can't let that define who I am. Like what I've what I've done isn't who I am. Some of the men in sensitive needs have committed heinous acts, but officers can't let their personal histories get in the way of the job. You might want to react different if you know why they're here. And on the sensitive need yards, you have a, a good idea of why a lot of these guys are here. You can look at it, you can see it, you can tell. And the less that I know about their crimes, the better it is for them and for me and for my partners. Officer Bishop will soon be looking after one new inmate on the sensitive needs yard. George Armenta is about to be released from the prison hospital. He has requested a transfer to SNY and has denounced his gang affiliation. They give all that up when they come over here. They know that, we know that, and if they decide they want to act upon their, their gang instincts, then we have to correct that. My family, you know, they ask me about the job all the time and, you know, said, you know, I had a good day. Nothing happened. Coming up. Your fists are only going to work part of the time. Three rookies join the keepers of Calipatria. The best tool you have is that hole between your nose and your chin. Learn to control it. Learn to make it work for you. Being a correctional officer at Calipatria State Prison seems like an undesirable job. Officers are constantly surrounded by some of California's most violent convicts, men who frequently attack without warning. And yet, there are plenty of job applicants. One inmate claims to know why. That's a good paying job for him. I mean, for the most part, it's a high paid babysitting job, you know? Sure, a lot of incidents happen and everything, isolated incidents. Officer Ritter finds comments like that hard to stomach. It makes you angry. There's no other way around it. I mean, there's no way to sugarcoat that. I have nice things because I work hard. I've earned them. I didn't come here to be a punching bag. I didn't come here to be a pincushion. I came here to do a job that the state says needs to be done. This is yard. This is as good as it gets. Today, Ritter is training three rookie officers. After a major staff assault in May of 95, they built the fences. Now, as you can see right along here, the fence used to be this high, right here. After the 2000 riot, where inmates were jumping the center fence to get involved in the fight, they decided to extend it and put the razor wire up on top. Ritter does his best to make sure these new hires know the harsh reality of their jobs. And if there's one thing, one piece of advice I can give you that will save you, your baton is only a tool. It's only going to save you part way. Your fists are only going to work part of the time. Your pepper spray may give you some distance in the fight, but the best thing that, that you can do, the best tool you have, is that hole between your nose and your chin. Learn to control it. Learn to make it work for you. Given the history at Calipatria, it's likely that these young men will be heeding Ritter's advice sooner rather than later. But despite the dangers, they're eager to meet the challenge. 
and I can come to work every day, know, know, know who's on my team and, and, and know who's on the other side. That, that's the main reason why I joined. I, I just tell my staff that they'll never get hurt alone. If they look over, they'll see me laying in the bed next to them. So that's really all you can depend on while you're in here is each other because nobody else is going to help you. In here, you're always going to be outnumbered. There's always going to be more inmates than officers. It becomes a family thing. He's got my back, I got his back. That's the way we, we, we make it through the day. For many, like Officer Melendres, injured during the 2005 riot, quitting was never an option. I told my family what, you know, had happened. They were like, you see, we told you, you know, are you going to quit now? And I told them, no. I'm not going to quit now. I can't. If anything, you know, this makes me even stronger, you know, I'm stronger as a person, you know, knowing that, you know, I can do this. I can do this. When I left every day for work, I always hugged my kids and always gave my wife a, uh, a kiss and told her I loved her because I didn't know if I'd be... On dusty desert ground just outside the prison walls, officers injured in the line of duty are recognized by the California Department of Corrections and Rehabilitation. When the call came, they came. When there was a need for a deed to be done, they did it. This is a Medal of Valor Awards ceremony, and I want to thank all of you for coming here today to honor the men and women and say thank you to them. Sergeant Pickett sitting over there. He's getting an award today. December 19th of just this last year was stabbed in the back by an inmate. He's here today and he's working. Officer Malcolm, you out there? Officer Malcolm doing his job. An inmate walks up behind him and slices his throat. This is, these people do this every single day. They come into work not knowing what's gonna happen. Today, there are few smiles at this ceremony because everyone involved knows it's only a matter of time before the next officer is injured in the line of duty. Just a fact of life for the keepers of Calipatria. two notes in my pocket for my family in case I never came out. And just saying goodbyes and telling them I love them. Tell them I went out fighting. That's pretty much my theory on life is always go out fighting.